speaker is uh, Jason Weston, and Jason is a research scientist in Facebook AI research, and he has done very influential work uh, in AI, and from his earlier work in support vector machine, and to memory network, and to more recent Parlay platform that unify different dialogue tasks, of course, including VQA and Visual Dialog. And today, and he has won the best paper award in ICML and ECML. And today, Jason is going to talk about unifying QA dialog and visual dialog. So we are looking to hear from you, Jason. Thanks. Hello. Hello. That's good. Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, so I actually haven't worked on visual QA uh, at all. I get, um, I've worked on uh, a lot of QA and dialogue. And so I guess I'm here to just kind of link it to that a bit. Um, so why dialogue for NLP researchers? NLP researchers actually spent a lot of time, if you look at their field, over the last, I don't know, 20 years or something, not doing dialogue been doing a lot of things like you know parsing and chunking and semantic role labeling and many many tasks that are kind of on the way to dialogue maybe but kind of dialogue is the fundamental thing you could think I mean it's language is about achieving communication goals so that's why it should be interesting for them um, so I consider sort of QA like the simplest kind of dialogue is kind of like two turn uh, dialogue so I sort of still fit it in there within dialogue and I sort of see dialogue where well, you can either see it as one gigantic task or lots, you know, thousands of little tasks, right? Um, so booking a restaurant, chatting, chatting about some topic, recommending something, um, answering a factual question, and so on. In fact, almost anything could actually be kind of posed as question answering anyway, right? You could uh, say a sentence and then say, translate this for me, or give me the part of speech tags for this or <laughs> whatever you want, right? So it's kind of a little bit nonsensical from that point of view, but you can see how it's like thousands of tasks. So, uh, so then by that point of view, visual QA has even more, right? Because it's got the QA and the, and the vision as well. Um, so why dialogue for vision researchers? Well, I guess you guys tell me. I just put some things I could think of here. Um, vision has got to the point where linking to speech acts or motor actions kind of makes more sense because you've got so much better. Uh, vision's always been mapped to things like text labels, right? Some uh, uh, like, you know, ImageNet predict, you know, predict the uh, labels. So, but, you know, QA and dialogue just kind of take that much, fur take that further as more sophisticated tests of whether you understand what's going on in the image. And dialogue's an interface to humans, which links it to more applications. Um, and language is a possible output and an input, which I think gives a lot of rich learning possibilities. So that's NLP researchers and vision researchers. What about machine learning researchers? Because somehow, you know, those learning algorithms are driving both of those. Um, I see Dialogue as a really awesome test bed for kind of uh, all the subtasks in ML that we haven't, like, you know, fully solved yet. I've listed some of them here task transfer, logical and common sense reasoning, memory, learning from interaction, learning compositionality, planning, and so on. Uh, here I just put a few talks from today that uh, mentioned some of those or addressed some of those to some degree. Um, some recent history of QA and dialogue. Um, so kind of a, a lot of um, question answering kind of started more in the information retrieval field, I guess. So it's kind of like vector space models and, and uh, you know, simple TF-IDF and things like that. And people have kind of changed the problem over time to try and look at harder versions of it, like harder questions or, um, you know, where you don't have the data redundancy of the whole web because that makes it much easier when there's like an exact match somewhere. Or in things like squad, people, uh, you know, the task is to put um, a context, a start end uh, around the, the answer rather than 
just return like a document or a sentence, which again makes it harder because you have to take into account the syntax. And that's where things like LSTMs and attention and stuff kind of start winning. Actually, if you look at squad as like a, a sentence ranking task and just return the right sentence, uh, those simple models start performing pretty well again. Um, so people also looked at things like knowledge bases and kind of dropped that now, I would say, to some degree, because and kind of looked more, gone back to more uh, reading uh, structured, you know, actual normal text, unstructured text. Um, so that's like a more machine reading task. So, uh, but those things are kind of more like comprehension given a paragraph. So squad data set is just given a paragraph and then you ask a question. So they kind of dropped the sort of large scale retrieval part, which was always an important part of question answering. There was, you know, it's always assumed that you have this kind of larger knowledge or memory and, uh, you know, that gives you lots of information, which is something the VQA task uh, doesn't really look at as much because you kind of more just look at the image. But you could, you could look at VQI tasks that did look, uh, have a more vital retrieval component. And then people are kind of, you know, doing quite well in the machine reading tasks like Squad and now starting to look a little bit more again <laughs> at machine reading at scale. So where, so you can look at, for example, Squad, the question and answers in Squad and try and answer them, but you're not given the paragraph anymore. Uh, uh, <laughs> so then you might be given the whole of Wikipedia. So we've looked at like tasks like that, which then becomes much harder again. But you know, hopefully we can leverage some of the things we've learned from Squad to be better at this more realistic task. So there's things like that. And then in dialogue, there's goal-oriented tasks like booking a restaurant, and then there's chit-chat tasks where people take like try and predict well the next uh, thing that someone said in Reddit or Twitter and so on. So all of these different data sets, why do people keep making different data sets? Uh, well, because, you know, sometimes they, uh, they can re-motivate how to solve one of these problems, like these problems that are put up here, because maybe the data set didn't really address exactly what you were looking for and it was too easy in some way. And you can see, you know, VQA itself has gone through a couple of iterations now, right? So we're always kind of continually changing that. And uh, so this is uh, just the example of the baby task here uh, from a few years ago. Very very simple stories with questions and uh, these, this data set kind of motivated doing uh, stacked attention in question answering I think for the first time um, and showing that that is actually looks kind of like you're doing something like reasoning when you do something like that so we use like memory networks for that which basically the memory is storing the you know the story and then you kind of attend over the story and and get back some results from retention. But then crucially, you go back and re-attend, so you could call that stacked attention as well. We called it like hops at the time. And, uh, and that was basically crucial. Uh, you could show, that here's some simple examples where it's doing attention over the lines in the story for this question, where is the milk? Um, that basically, if you don't do these stacked attention, you don't do well. So, so those, that data set kind of, really motivated using attention there um, and there's many other attention models some of them around the same time has RNN search and uh, neural tree machine uh, around almost the same time actually motivated by different things and since then a lot more attention models so uh, so that's one reason you know to kind of look at new data sets to motivate models these were results are on the baby task. This is just a note to say when you take 10,000 training examples, so a lot of people produce new models and try to push that number down and uh, they've got to kind of like, there are 20 different tasks in that data set and like all of them are basically solved if you have 10,000 training examples. So some people think it's solved, but actually if you go down to 1,000 training examples, um, then it's not. Uh, many of those models actually look pretty bad and they like overfit badly. So this is showing that, um, you know, they, data efficiency, task transfer kind of things aren't really solved. Uh, this is something that Derek mentioned earlier uh, about VQA as well, the, the data is quite big, but we also need to look at, you know, can we make data efficient models too? Um, 
And the interesting thing about when you're building new data sets is that you know you can you can understand where your models break and you can iterate this thing. So I see sort of the iteration on models and data sets as this complementary thing. You know they kind of uh, break each other uh, so that we can move towards uh, AI hopefully. Um, so you know the baby data sets synthetic. So you've got to show those kind of models work on real data sets. So there's been, since then, a slew of real data sets uh, that have pushed forward models in QA, textual QA. Uh, this is just one of them that my group made, children's book test. It's uh, like real children's stories from Project Gutenberg instead of these baby data sets. Uh, been a whole bunch of numbers of models on those data sets. Memory networks were working quite well on some of the tasks, and since then, all the numbers have been pushed up with various kind of uh, attention models of various kinds. Um, yeah, so uh, I haven't even got the latest ones there. That's from last year. Uh, and the same thing on squad, right? So this is the top of the squad leaderboard. This is forever creeping up a little bit. Um, but I want to get to a warning. Uh, it's kind of about looking at just like one data set. Um, if you do that and you, you, know, you build a model that works on, say, well on squad or something like this, you have to be worried about um, research that's kind of stuck only on that problem. So, uh, and I've seen this in a sort of a bunch of different data sets over, over time. So when people working on knowledge bases and like web questions data set, there was like a ton of algorithms made on that, but like none of them have been applied on squad as far as I know, right? So it's kind of like, what did, how much did we actually learn from those algorithms? Like we're, maybe we're wasting our time, right? So, uh, and then on squad, uh, it has issues, I mean, mostly because they made this assumption that you have a knowledge base, right? On squad, you also have issues. You have things like you have to predict the start and end context indices. And also, there's a lot of word overlap that people have shown between the question and the, uh, that context. And so a lot of those models just predict those two indices, which is kind of like makes them invalid for like many other QA tasks even, let alone dialogue tasks. Um, Baby itself had this thing that it was using supporting facts and it was synthetic. Um, some of these other tasks, like children's book tests, you had to fill in a, a missing word, so they're not really normal QA tasks, and so on. So, a uh, <laughs> picture of Svetlana from this morning. Uh, he had this slide, how do we train a single network of multiple tasks using multiple data sets? So, this is uh, something we've been working on uh, this year called Parlay, um, which tried to address some of these issues by putting like all the tasks basically in one really easy to access place for the community. So this is uh, open source on GitHub. Uh, it's actually a repository of both uh, learning agents and tasks. Um, so there's a bunch of tasks supported, like all the text QA and dialogue ones I've mentioned, but also uh, VQA data sets as well. Um, and there's integration with Mechanical Turk for collecting new data sets so that we can continue <laughs> this tradition of like, uh, uh, of, you know, the cycle of models and data sets. So yeah, we spent quite some time uh, trying to engineer this thing to cover all the cases that we could. Um, I'm not really going to have time to talk about the, its infrastructure, so I'm just going to like mention what's inside it right now. So, yeah, this is just breaking down the tasks into QA, into goal-oriented dialogue, chit-chat, sentence completion, and VQA and visual dialogue. And uh, I think it was released in May, and the ones here in blue are basically ones that have been added since. So we've actually had some uh, community participation where we've had people sending in pull requests, adding in data sets, so that's pretty nice to see. And um, I think, uh, yeah, Derek was saying earlier this morning, uh, like we shouldn't have lots of VQA data sets, we should have one VQA data set. And uh, I mean, that just seems sort of impossible to me that, that you know, we, we're not gonna keep making data sets that test different things, but 
if you have a system like Parlay where you can access all these things at once, then you can look at it as one big data set. Um, so we've, we specifically made it like super easy. You can actually, so you, there's like on the command line, you put minus T for task, and then you can name one of these tasks, or you can put all, for example, <laughs> and, you, and you just get all of them. And then it just sort of randomly samples the training from all of them, which is kind of crazy, but you know, you can do it. So, uh, and it, you know, I assume that will be useful one day. So the, the, uh, the rest of here is just a bunch of slides of uh, pictures of what's inside these data sets. Going to flick through these. Um, so yeah, to summarize, why, why unify this thing? Well, we don't want models that are just one trick ponies. Uh, we, you know, we don't want this siloed research where no one's going to use this model ever again when, when we look at a new problem, as I was mentioning with some things that have happened. We can find model weaknesses uh, across these data sets. And that's kind of also uh, what uh, Derek was speaking about earlier today, where you could take VQA and you could separate it into uh, different subtasks, right, and look at the error rates on the subtasks, where you can also do that across uh, data sets effectively uh, if you understand what each of them is doing. And we can also do, study things like task transfer, and, and compositionality, where if some of these tasks are, are simpler than others, then maybe we can actually you know, multitask and build up um, more complex reasoning. And maybe one day we'll get close to AI and, and assume then an agent you know, will, should be good at all this dialogue, right? So assume, I would assume having all this data handy in one place would make sense. Um, so yeah, and, and just in the last, a few minutes, I'm just going to go back to uh, another example of uh, a new data set uh, which explores, I mean, I mean, as a machine learning researcher, I kind of like to go back to these sort of fundamental problems that we have, and it's like, how are we going to attack them? Like, what's the new research going to be? Uh, and, you know, that m might be a new model. Uh, which is showing that thing on the existing data set, or it may be that you don't have a data set that does it, uh, so you need to create data, right? And that's sort of happened quite often. So here, uh, I've been focusing on learning from interaction, uh, and I was looking at the situation where uh, a model is learning how to answer questions, but it doesn't just have question-answer training pairs. It's um, answering questions, and then the teacher is responding back with textual uh, feedback. So uh, this relates to Sonia's talk uh, earlier. Um, so yeah, so you get something like this, where is Mary, the teacher asks, and the, the uh, learner responds playground, and then the teacher could say, no, that's incorrect, right? So you know, a normal QA data set, this doesn't exist, right? So this is why you need to collect a new data set. But this actually, you know, looks a lot more natural in terms of if you want a learner to be out there in the world, like learning from humans, which I think we do, because that's going to be really the way that we really collect data and learn in the end, not just these static data sets that are on the internet, then we want to be able to learn from stuff like this. So the thing is, um, you know, no, that's incorrect. It's just kind of like reward zero. So it looks like, oh, we could just, this kind of like reinforcement learning. We could maybe just turn the text into a reward. But you can get a lot more rich things that are said. Uh, you could get things like, no, the answer is kitchen coming from the teacher, or, uh, or a hint like, no, uh, the answer is one of the rooms downstairs. There's a lot of different ways they could say it. And that, which is much more signal than a, a zero reward that you would get from reinforcement learning, right? So it's how, how to use that signal, I think, is an incredibly important thing if we want to learn online while talking. Um, so uh, yeah, we built a data set with, using MTurk with this kind of feedback from humans on a, a QA task about movies. And uh, the model that we, we used to solve it so far is is a, well, it could be any model here, it's a, a memory network, but the important thing is we bolted on this thing at the end, which uh, conditional on the thing that was said, uh, it tries to predict what the teacher would say back, right? So we call this forward prediction. So um, the idea is basically, if I go back to this slide, 
where is Mary? I'm going to answer playground. If I can predict that conditional on answering that I'm going to say playground, that the teacher's going to say, no, that's incorrect. If I can predict this, I'm kind of a long way there to understanding what's the right thing to say. So this is why you want to do this, this prediction task. And we showed that that can work very well in some circumstances. Uh, here it's compared across epics, uh, the test accuracy, compared to reinforcement learning. Uh, so, and it basically can actually work better than reinforcement learning um, with just the textual rewards. So no, it's actually, I mean, you can think of it as completely unsupervised. It's just text, text, text. But actually there is, a, you know, a rich supervisory signal in there if you can extract it. And, you know, it's much more rich than the reward, as I was explaining, potentially. So, uh, so yeah, that's it. So basically, Dialog's an excellent test bed for research. Uh, I think, you know, we should be iterating over, over model innovation and dialogue task creation to uh, solve these fundamental ML subtasks. And I think one interesting area there that I'm working on now is uh, Dialog gives us a chance to learn while converting. So for example, you could, you could also have your model asking questions, right, rather than answering questions. So that's something else I've been working on. And uh, for unifying all these tasks and avoiding siloed research, I encourage you to use Parlay. <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Questions? Hi, thank you. Um, can you can you say a bit more on on the last thing with the movies? H how did you solve the problem um, that the model is evolving over time? Or did you? Uh, yeah, um, we now we just have a very simple like exploration like epsilon. Is that what you mean? Like like because, what people because use. Because the the correction from the human is only valid at a certain stage of the model, right? Well, that correction is still true. I mean, if you think of it as like experience replay or something like that, that correction is still always true in the future. So if you know this. Like, if you think of this as a log of something I did when I was a child, if I go back to that training example and try and predict, the, do the forward prediction to predict what the teacher said, it's still a good training example for forward oh, prediction. Okay. But if, if it's not... Even though I'm getting better. Yeah. I mean, actually, that's what differentiates this kind of data set very much from a standard dialogue data set. A standard dialogue data set, you kind of have two expert learners, and that's kind of assumed. But our, our bots are terrible, right? So the actual data sets we really need are kind of like one's really bad and one's really good, like this, and understanding how to learn, sort of to learn to learn from that data and get better, uh, which we don't really sort of have that data. You can imagine these would be logs over time, yeah. Now it works. Yeah, so Jason, can you tell a bit more uh, about Parlay? Because I heard there are like, rents available for that. And oh. I haven't heard about that yet. I should have mentioned that. That's really, thanks. Yes, uh, yeah, so there's actually a, a call for uh, fun, uh, proposals for uh, universities uh, where we're going to fund uh, seven of those. I think the deadline's in like a month or something like that. So you have to write just like a, a two-page proposal or something pretty light. And the funding's between 10 and 20K per proposal. So we're trying to encourage people to use it to um, uh, collect new data sets or uh, share their data sets or share their learning agents uh, within Parlay. For the uh, Powder AI, I was wondering, uh, is there any legal issue uh, if people collect data uh, online or, and share it? Is there any, uh, under what kind of agreement do people share uh, their data and the model online? Um, 
with the call with the call for proposal or using Parlay to do it? Using Parlay to do it, as far as I know, they will, I mean, you can collect data as you want and you don't have to uh, serve it from within Parlay, uh, but you can. I mean, but I mean, you should probably look at the license agreement on Parlay. So yeah, I've tried to make that as open as possible with the lawyers. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hello. So as I was saying, within joining just one year of graduate school, Abhishek has done very interesting work on visual dialogue, from proposing a new task and collecting a large scale data set to training di dialogue agents via reinforcement learning to play cooperative games. Today, Abhishek is going to talk about visual dialogue. Looking forward to hear from you. Test, test. All right, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Ishwarya. I'm obviously very happy to be here. Uh, I have one quick announcement. So uh, we have a bunch of t-shirts. Um, so poster presenters, uh, please do not forget to collect your t-shirts. And uh, we will hopefully have a few extra, and we will uh, then distribute it to the audience. This is after the uh, panel, which is 6 o'clock. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Abhishek Das. I'm a second year PhD student at Georgia Tech. And today I'm going to be talking about some of my work in this space of visual dialogue uh, that I've been involved in over the past year or so. So the, so the idea is that we want to build agents that can see and talk. Uh, so give you an example of what it involves. Given this image and a one-line description, a man and a woman are holding umbrellas. A human might ask a follow-up question, what color is his umbrella? So to, so to answer this question, the model has to understand which person the word his refers to. Uh, focus on the umbrella held by that person, and then respond back in natural language, his umbrella is black. A human might then ask, what about hers? Note that this is a more complicated reference. Not only does the model have to understand which person the word her refers to, it also has to understand the object being asked about based on dialogue history, which is the umbrella, focus on the umbrella in the image, and then predict an answer in natural language. Hers is multicolored. A human might ask another follow-up question. How many other people are in the image? Uh, to answer this, the model has to uh, keep in its memory the people in discussion up to that point, reason about exclusion, and be able to convey uncertainty in its response. I think three, they are occluded. And why are we studying this task of visual dialogue? So, a few uh, real examples can be that, uh, let's say there are robots that are deployed in some hostile environment, uh, and we can interact with the robot in natural language in, in the sense that we can give it natural language instructions or ask questions. So for example here, is there smoke in any room around you? Yes, in one room. Go there and look for people, and so on. We can also have, uh, they can also be visually impaired users. So if their friends upload an image on some social, social media, uh, the user should be able to ask questions about it to a visual chatbot. So for example here, uh, Peter uploaded an image, uh, and they're asked, great, is he at the beach? No, on a mountain, and so on. They can also be uh, situationally impaired users. Uh, so what I mean is that essentially there can be a there can be an information retrieval scenario where uh, the user is iteratively querying via natural language uh, queries. So for example, here did anyone enter the room last week? Yes, 127 instances logged. Were any of them carrying a black bag and so on? So more concretely, the task of visual dialogue is that given an image, a dialogue history consisting of a sequence of question-answer pairs and a follow-up question. The model has to produce a free-form natural language answer. 
And the way we evaluate models for this task is that given a list of 100 answer options that consist of nearest neighbors that serve as hard negatives, popular and random answers, the model has to uh, return a sorted list and is evaluated on how well it ranks the ground truth human response in that list. Right. And so we collect a large scale data set for this task on Mechanical Turk, uh, where we pair two humans on a, on a live chat interface. So one of them uh, is assigned the role of a questioner and is shown just the image caption, as shown on the left. Uh, the other is assigned the role of an answerer and is shown the image along with its caption, uh, as shown on the right. And the task is for the questioner uh, to ask questions to be able to imagine the scene better. And I'd like to mention here that a Mechanical Turk is not naturally set up for multi-user tasks, so we, we had to implement our own backend system completely from scratch, and that includes uh, maintaining a queue of online users, pairing them up in real time, and, and sort of having checks in place so that they can't pair up with themselves and like, make lots of money and so on. And code for that entire backend system is publicly available on GitHub. So I encourage you to check it out. In total, uh, version 0.9 of the WizDial dataset contains dialogues on 120,000 images from Coco. Uh, it has one dialogue per image, consisting of 10 rounds of question answers, amounting to a total of 1.2 million dialogue question answers. And th all this data is publicly available for download on visualdialog.org. Coming to models, we propose uh, models of the encoder-decoder framework. So we have three kinds of encoders in the paper and two kinds of decoders. I'll first go over the, quickly go over the decoders. So uh, the generative decoder is essentially an RNN that's, learned to, uh, that's learning to maximize the likelihood of the ground truth human response. And at test time, we feed in uh, each of the 100 options and rank them by the log likelihood scores that the model assigns them. And the discriminative decoder is actually getting to see the 100 options during training. And uh, it computes dot product between the input encoding, which is coming from the encoder, and the LSTM encoding of each of those 100 options. And we essentially have a 100 way soft max of it. Coming to the encoders, uh, the memory network encoder uh, performs best. So I'm going to go, go uh, focus on just that one in the interest of time. So the, what the memory network encoder does is that given an image, a question, and uh, dialogue history, we first encode the image in question with a convolutional neural network and an LSTM respectively. Um, so, and then we concatenate those two feature vectors, and which is then projected down to a 512 dimension vector. Then each round of dialogue history is independently encoded with an LSTM. Uh, this can be thought of as representations of facts stored in the memory of the model, where each fact consists of a question answer pair. We then compute dot product attention between the image question embedding and each round of dialogue history. So this lets the model retrieve facts relevant for answering the current question. The attended dialogue uh, features are then combined back with the image question embedding and then fed to the decoder to generate a response. And the whole model is trained end to end. Code for memory network and other encoder decoder models is, is available on GitHub. I'd like to point out here that we've spent quite a bit of time uh, making this code base as modular as possible. So it's, it's actually very easy to just arbitrarily combine different encoders with different decoders and train the whole thing end to end. We also have a demo uh, that's up on demo.visualdialog.org where anyone can upload any image and talk to a visual chatbot. So here, for example, the user uploads an image. The model first generates a caption, a large building with a clock tower in the middle. Where's this? Looks like a city. Are there other buildings? Yes. Are they tall? Yes. Great. How's the weather? Cloudy. Anything else? There's a building in the background, but I can't tell what it is, and so on. Coming to the results, uh, we, we have this table in the pa paper, which I won't go into details of. So essentially what this has is that all possible combinations of encoders and decoders uh, combined with all combina combinations of modalities with and without question, uh, with and without image, with and without history, and so on. And we also have uh, VQA model baselines uh, that we compare with. So our best performing model is the memory network encoder, uh, which assigns a mean rank of uh, about 17 in the generative decoding case and a mean rank of 5.5 in the discriminative decoding case. So that's, that's the mean rank of ground truth human response out of a list of 100 answer options that it's given. And there's also more recent work coming out of our lab in, co in collaboration with researchers at FAIR uh, that, that further improves on these numbers. I'd like to mention that there's also concurrent work coming out of Mila, where uh, they've, they've collected a dialogue data set of binary questions via a guess what game between two humans on Mechanical Turk. And this paper is also at CUPR this year. 
So coming to qualitative results, uh, these uh, here are some examples. So here what we're doing is the questions are from uh, the, the visual dialogue data set. The answers are predictions of our model. So for example, given this image uh, and the question, is the bottle open? Yes. Red or white wine? Red. Is there only one glass? Yes. Any food? No. What color is the table? Brown, and so on. So the model does a reasonably good job. Here's another example. Uh, what color is the building? Brown. What color is the clock? Black and white. Is it digital or analog? Analog, and so on. Here's another example. So given this image uh, and the question, what color is the cat? Orange and white. Is the cat on the floor? Yes. What's the cat on? I can't tell. So clearly, there's some inconsistency going on there. Uh, then after that, the next question is, can you see anything in the mirror? And the model responds with, no, just the cat and the cat, which is sort of this amusing uh, response, because the model probably sees two heads of the cat. So here's another example. What color is the vase? White. Can you tell what kind of flowers? I can't tell. And then later in the dialogue, what's the vase on? Can't tell. Does this look like someone's home? Can't tell. So this is sort of a popular uh, failure mode of, of our model. Uh, it often results to these sort of generic responses when it's not sure of what the answer is. So it'll say, I can't tell or can't see, and so on. And the, and the reason it happens is that the way we are training the, uh, this model is that uh, given some dialogue history and a follow-up question, it's trained to produce the answer. And irrespective of the answer it produces, uh, at the next round, we feed in ground truth human dialogue history. So it doesn't get to see its errors during training. So it doesn't get to steer, steer the conversation. And another limitation of this sort of uh, training in a supervised learning paradigm is that there's a vast space of relevant responses to each question, and it only gets to see one. It, it, it only It's only trained to maximize the likelihood, likelihood of one that's in the, in the data set. Right? So ideally, what we want is that we want these models to be able to see the errors they make during training to be more robust and uh, to better explore this vast space of relevant responses. And so this gives in naturally to like a reinforcement learning setup, uh, which is what we do in our follow-up work. So, so we, have, we now have two agents, Qbot and Abot. Um, so Qbot is, is a questioning agent. It's, it asks questions. And it's blindfolded, so it cannot see an image. Abot is the answering agent, and it has access to a secret image. And they're playing this image guessing game, uh, where Abot first generates an image description, and then there's, there's this dialogue of question answers, uh, at the end of which Qbot makes a guess of what it thinks the secret image is. Right. And more concretely, the setup is that there are two agents, Qbot and Abot. Uh, the environment is the image. Which is uh, from which the reward is uh, derived, and the action space is that Qbot's generating a question, Abot's generating an answer, and additionally Qbot's also making a prediction of the image feature vector. This is a this is a regression uh, uh, prediction that Qbot is additionally making at the end of every round of question answer, and the state for Qbot and Abot consists of previous previous rounds of dialogue history, and Abot additionally has uh, information about the image. So in this paper, we first uh, conduct experiments on a, on a toy, toy task, where uh, we assume perception to be fully solved. So images consist of instances that are defined by these color shape attribute, uh, color shape style attributes. And uh, the, th these two agents interact with discrete symbols, which are initialized randomly. And we see that uh, they, while playing this image guessing game, uh, they discover how to ground these symbols in sort of uh, physical meanings. Right? And there, there are more details about these experiments in, in this uh, insightful paper by my lab mate, Satvik Kutur, which is uh, to appear later this year at EMLP. So coming to the, the models for the real image, real image experiments, uh, so what we have is on the left, on the, in green, is the QBOT policy network. And the, on the right is the ABOT policy network. So uh, given some state, QBOT first generates a question, so, which is essentially a, an LSTM, which is generating uh, the question word by word. Right? It passes over the question to the answering agent. The answering agent has access to the image, which is encoded with a VGG16 CNN. It has access to the question, which is encoded with uh, an LSTM. And it also has this uh, hierarchical recurrent structure that it uses to encode the entire dialogue history. So what's essentially happening is that there are, there are two levels of recurrent neural networks. At the lowest level, there's a fact encoder. Uh, which is independently encoding each round of dialogue history, uh, which is essentially a question-answer pair. And at the higher level, there's uh, a history encoder, which is taking in the fact encoding uh, 
for every round of dialogue and combining all of that to, to a single joint representation of the dialogue. And conditioned on that history encoding, uh, a bot generates the answer. So for example, in this case, no, there aren't any. It passes on the answer to Qbot. Qbot en encodes that question and answer, updates its state, and then makes a prediction of the image feature vector. And the reward is derived from that. So the reward is essentially how close the uh, prediction of the image feature vector is before and after uh, the current round of question answer. And the way we train these models is that they're first uh, pre-trained in a supervised manner on the visual dialogue data set. So the question, answer, and uh, image feature regression are all from the data set. And uh, then they're fine-tuned with reinforcement learning where the reward is derived, derived from how close the how close Qbot's guess of the image is to the ground truth image, and, the, and Qbot and Abot both get the same reward. Coming to results, so uh, these are both uh, Qbot Abot dialogues. So on the left is results from the supervised pre trained models, and on the right are results from the reinforcement learning fine tuned models. So what's happening is that on the left, as you can see, um, these models. So how old is the man? I can't see his face. I don't know. What is he wearing? Shorts and t-shirt. What color is his shirt? White. What colors are his pants? Black. And then later in the dialogue, what color are his shoes? What color are his shoes? And so on. So it, it, there are two things to notice here. For the answer to the first question is a generic uh, safe response. I can't see his face, so I don't know. Whereas the face is clearly visible in the image. And, and later in the dialogue, uh, Qbot and Abot keep repeating the questions and answers. On the right, in the case of uh, the reinforcement fine-tuned bots, uh, the questions are longer, they're much more diverse, and they're a lot more image discriminative. So for example, what color is skateboard? It's hard to tell, but I think it's black. So it's, it, 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 do, it doesn't know for sure, but it, it's still trying to answer the question. Is he wearing helmet? Yes. Is he wearing knee pads? No, no knee pads, and so on. So is it, yeah. Here's another example. So on the left is the super is pre-trained bots. How old is man? He looks like in, he's in his 20s. What's he wearing? T-shirt and jeans. What color is his hair? Black. What's he wearing? What color is his hair? And they keep repeating. And on the right, there's the re reinforcement learning bots. Where, where's man located? Looks like cl classroom of some sort. What's man wearing? Black T-shirt and jeans, and so on. So a, a few takeaways here that when we, find, when we do this sort of fine tuning uh, via this image guessing game, the question and answers are longer. Uh, they're much more image discriminative. We can also perform quantitative evaluation. So at, after each round of dialogue history, uh, after each round of dialogue, uh, the, the questioning agent is making a guess of what it thinks the image is, right? So we can, so given a pool of, let's say, 10,000 images, uh, we can see how close that image prediction is to the ground truth, ground truth image, and we can see what the rank of the ground truth image is, right? So here we are plotting the percentile rank on the y-axis, and uh, dialogue round on the x-axis. So we see that the SL pre-trained bots are much worse uh, than the RL bots at this image guessing game. And then we also have a bunch of ablations in the paper where we freeze dip different parts of the model and we evaluate them, uh, them uh, at the same task of this image guessing game. In follow-up work, we also have human-in-the-loop evaluation of these models, where what we do is that we are fine-tuning these models with reinforcement learning uh, in the way I described earlier, and then we are pairing uh, the answering agent with a human, and they're actually playing this image-guessing game. So here what's happening is that uh, given this pool of images, uh, there's a human that's asking questions. So for example, what's he doing? He's standing and looking at the camera, and after each question answer, the human is making a guess of what it thinks the image is. So more details of this work is in uh, the uh, recent EdgeComp uh, submission that we had from our lab. Uh, so in summary, the result that we see is that even though in our earlier work we see that Qbot, Abot uh, get better at this image guessing game uh, when we fine tune them with reinforcement learning, uh, even though that happens, when we pair them with humans, we don't really see a difference in, uh, in the image guessing game. So that sort of, uh, we don't see a difference in image guessing game between the supervised pre-trained and the reinforcement learning agents. So that's sort of an interesting result there. To, so to give you a summary of uh, uh, the work that I've been talking about so far, we, I first talked about visual dialogue, where we proposed the task, data set, encoder, decoder models, and that's a paper at, at CUPR this year. Uh, 
Then I talked about training these models with reinforcement learning via this image guessing game, which is to appear later this year at ICCV. Uh, then I talked about human in the loop evaluation of these models, which is to appear uh, at HCOM this year and is work led by uh, my lab mates. Right? And data set code models for all of these uh, are, are available on visualdialog.org. So coming to some of my uh, more recent ongoing work, um, we're looking at uh, what we call dialog rollouts via mental models. So what's happening is that till now we were doing beam, uh, like vanilla beam search inference in these models where the two agents are talking to each other. So instead of that, the, here the idea is that uh, each agent has a mental model of the other side within it. So for example, if the other side is not good at answering uh, color questions, for example, the a uh, questioning agent should learn to not ask color questions. So that's the idea, that there's a mental model that each agent has, has of the other side within it. Right? And we are, so this is ongoing work. And uh, so uh, all of this was work in the, visual, uh, in the visual dialogue space. More recently, I've also been interested in sort of extending this setup to actions. Uh, so there's this data set of 3D models for indoor scenes that was, the, that was at this CVPR. Uh, this, so this is essentially 3D models of, of like house, lots of houses, right? And so there's work from FAIR, which uh, extended, which built an environment out of these 3D models data set. So here what's happening is that uh, the, all objects are obstacles and these agents have a fixed height. They can go through doors. Um, and it's pretty fast. It runs, on, it, it, it runs at 200 FPS on a single thread uh, with support for multi-threading, right? And now that we have this environment, we can have high-level tasks, uh, such as what we are calling for now embodied question answering. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the agent is randomly spawned in some environment, and it's given a question, let's say, what color is the car? Uh, it's in the living room, so it has to first localize. Then it has to understand the car would typically be outside the house. It has to go outside. It has to find out the car, and then it has to answer the question in natural language. So I'd like to thank all my uh, collaborators in, in this. So it has been a wonderful year. Uh, so I'd like to thank my collaborators, Satvik, Khushi, Avi, Deshraj, Prithvi, Viraj, Arjun, uh, Jose, Mike, Georgia, Stefan, Devi, and Drew. And uh, that brings me to the end of my talk. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Abhishek. Uh, we can take some questions now. Any questions? Thank you, that was really cool. So um, one thing I was wondering if you tried to run the RL experiment when you don't pre-train on the data that you collected. Have you tried that? Um, we haven't tried that yet, but my intuition is that uh, that will totally fail. Uh, so the idea is why I feel that is that uh, Supervised pre-training gets them to the right ballpark of, of what is English, and so if, if we like train with RL from scratch, it wouldn't even know what the end token is, and so on. Uh -huh. right? So it needs to get into the right ballpark, and then uh, human dialogue data set because there's it, it, there is some noise there. If it gets to better explore uh, the questions answers with RL fine tuning, then yeah, that can improve performance. Because one thing I was wondering if. Um, would it make sense for the agent answering questions to kind of to learn to ignore the questions and actually just try to communicate what the vector is? Like essentially, what is the, the you know, real value vector? And, and just hope that the person asking questions will just learn to take the input correctly. And could that happen? Or? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Um, so in our experience, we, are not, we don't have any weight sharing uh, or any passing of continuous vectors between these two models. They're just interacting via natural language, which are the street symbols. So it's, it's not possible for the answering agent to uh, pass on the image feature vector uh, to, to the questioning agent. But uh, yeah, so, so uh, if we have this natural language bottleneck, uh, I don't think it, it's possible for them to pass on the complete feature vector. OK, and just one last quick one. So you're, you're looking at the difference between the predicted vector and the actual one, you could probably have had 
a final task, which is, okay, now classify correctly within these negatives. Uh, why predict, like that That seems an, like an alternative sort of goal that you might want to try to achieve in these environments. So is, what was the motivation for actually predicting the vector as opposed to doing that? Um, yeah, so, so we could have this scenario where instead of predicting this feature vector, uh, Qbert ha has a set of, a pool of images and it's doing classification over that pool, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's a reasonably, that's a reasonable point. Uh, it's just that we first set it up and okay. it worked reasonably well and so we went ahead with it, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, our last speaker for today is Hugo LaRochelle. Hugo leads the Google Brain Group in Montreal. Before this, he worked as a research scientist at Twitter Cortex. He is also an adjunct professor at University de Sherbrooke and University de Montreal. Hugo has made a number of influential contributions across the spectrum of what is now known as deep learning. From greedy layer-wise training of deep networks to Bayesian hyperparameter optimization, zero-shot learning, meta-learning, and reinforcement learning. Today, Hugo is going to talk to us about, guess what, visual object discovery through multimodal dialogue. We look forward to hearing from you. All right, thank you. Thanks for the nice intro. Um, so yes, I will talk about, guess what, this is a paper that appeared at this CVPR, uh, joint work with uh, Harm, sitting right there, and uh, all my wonderful co-authors here. I should say, uh, you know, this work wouldn't have been possible without the great work that Harm and Florian did. And as far as I know, early on, the, this is really the brainchild of Aaron Corville. Uh, and so what I hope to do, even though this was presented as a conference, is just give you an extended sort of presentation of what this was. And I thank the previous speaker for mentioning that work. Uh, it is indeed in the sort of same lines uh, uh, of inquiry. And um, so essentially what Guess What is, it's a two-player game. Uh, there's one player that I'll call the Oracle. What the oracle sees when the player starts, sees an image, and there is an uh, object in the image that has been segmented out and selected. And now the other player, which is the questioner, only sees the image and needs to ask questions to determine what is this segmented out object that the oracle sees but the questioner isn't seeing. And that's essentially the game, so it needs to ask enough questions and interpret the yes, no answers from the oracle. The oracle only answers with yes or no or not applicable if the question makes no sense or is inappropriate. And, uh, and then the question needs to guess the right objects uh, amongst all the possible objects in the image. That's essentially the game. Um, so why is that interesting? Um, if you're interested in VQA, and I'm assuming if you're here that uh, you are, um, well, that's kind of a way of gamifying how you could collect uh, question-answer pairs for yes-no questions. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, if you're interested in grounded language learning, well, obviously, this is agents that are talking with, you know, speaking with language uh, in the context of images. So uh, the questioner, for instance, needs to learn about objects and how they relate to others in visual scenes. Um, if you're just interested in, in task-oriented dialogue, I think this is particularly interesting. Um, the, there is a clear notion of success in this game, which is just the dialogue was successful if the questioner guessed the object right. So for other types of dialogue research, such as chit-chat, there isn't always a very clear notion of success, whereas here it's very, very clear, uh, very straightforward. Um, if you're interested in interpretable computer vision, I think that's interesting in the sense that you essentially have agents that answer questions about what they're seeing, observing in images. That makes them more interpretable. Um, and more on the machine learning side, I think if you're interested in just RL in large action spaces, well, here, if you were to train both agents by RL, the action space, as was described in the previous talk, is essentially words. So that's very, very high dimensional. And not just words, but sentences. Uh, so if you're doing research in RL in large high dimensional spaces, I think some of the solutions might be, uh, this might make for a nice benchmark for evaluating these solutions. Um, if you're interested in communication that emerges between RL agents, of course it's a game where at the center is communication. Um, so they need to learn and agree on a common language together to really solve the game. Though really what I'll talk about today is the data collection that we did to actually get you know, actual questions and answers from real people. So there, the language is sort of agreed upon between, you know, us humans. 
Um, and maybe not so obvious, but I think it's also interesting in the context of meta-learning. So you can think of the questioner as essentially asking questions to collect labels for being a detector of the object, of an object in the image. So I think some solutions from the meta-learning community could be applied here for, say, the questioner that leads to become a classifier for a particular object in an image. And that's one connection that I find particularly interesting. All right. So I described the game very quickly, but I actually go through uh, examples of running this game. I'll start with the Oracle. Um, so the Oracle, when uh, he's starting to play, sees an image as well as an object that has been segmented out, which is right here. Um, and so you see the selected object, and that's the object that the oracle needs to answer questions correctly from the questioner so that the questioner can guess that this is the object that's selected. Keeping in mind that the questioner will not see that uh, this object is selected up, will only see this image. Um, we also provide, as additional information, what is the category of the object as extra information. In this case, this is a person. Um, and then the oracle sort of just waits for the first question from the questioner. So there's this other player asking the first question. In this case, it is asking, uh, if, uh, is it a person? And then the oracle can answer yes, no, or not applicable. So in this case, the oracle would click yes, because that's essentially a, a person here. Not essentially, it's a person. Um, and then, so you answer by clicking. And then you get another question from the questioner once uh, the question has uh, received the answer from the oracle. In this case, the questioner is asking, is it a girl? Um, now, in this situation, it might not be super easy to be able to know. So it turns out we have this little feature where you can just turn off the mask so you can actually see uh, the actual pixels behind the mask. It makes it easier. So indeed, in this case, it's a girl. So the answer is yes. So it's clicking on yes. And so on and so forth with other questions. Is she standing inside the ring? The answer is no. Uh, is she sitting? The answer is yes. And then at some point, the questioner determines, OK, I've had enough answers that I feel confident I can answer the question correctly. That is, I can guess which object has been selected. And so this is marked here when you're on the Oracle side as your partner started guessing. And then you know whether or not the uh, dialogue was successful. Now that's on the oracle side. On the questioner side, um, you just see the image. So this is a different game, so it's a different image. And you don't see what object was selected, as I mentioned. Not just that, we actually don't see what are the potential objects. So that's sort of something that the questioner has to infer, looking at the image, sort of guess, OK, I guess you know the few people uh, out there might be potential objects. Uh, this person here, uh, I don't know, maybe a ball here, and so on. And now I won't go through the whole dialogue, but here eventually the questioner asks first question, gets an answer from the oracle, and this back and forth continues. And let's say after all of these questions, the questioner determines, OK, I feel like I can answer, the, uh, I can actually figure out which object is uh, selected on the oracle side. Can click on guess what to actually now make a prediction. Once the user clicks on guess what, all the objects uh, that are potential candidates are shown to the uh, questioner. And all the questioner has to do is click on the correct mask, with a mask that uh, he or she believes is the uh, object in question. So that's the game. I can take questions whenever, by the way. So if there are questions, please don't hesitate and raise your hand. I'll repeat it for, for everyone. Um, so here's a few examples of games for three different images. Uh, so And you see sort of the mask, for instance, here it's the cat. So is it a person? No. Is it a cat? Yes. Is it in the hands of these girls? Uh, no. Uh, the, cat in, the cat in the right side of the image? Yes. And then presumably here the um, questioner got it right. So you have a few more examples here. Um, so the way we collected the data set, we took uh, uh, image Coco, uh, images from uh, the MS Coco data set. And uh, so that means for any given image, there will be in the data set multiple dialogues corresponding to the various potential uh, objects that could have been shown to the Oracle. 
Some of the dialogues can be fairly long. So in this case, the object to select, if you're not seeing it, is this one right here. It's the Wii controller, I think. Um, so here you see that the questioner had to work quite hard before getting enough evidence of what this might be. So there's a lot of variations in the size of the dialogues. And you can see here the strategy is sort of try to do some form of binary search. You know, you want to ask questions early on that might remove a lot of potential candidates. And, and as you, you know, continue sort of all the potential candidates that would satisfy the first one, you want to, again, ideally divide those in half. Uh, so you kind of need to be clever in answering uh, these, qu uh, in proposing questions. And that's kind of nice because it means that maybe exposes a sort of hierarchy between objects in visual scenes where there might be properties that are more generic or split potential objects in half and other ones that are more specialized. Um, a related work to this is the referit data set where for a selected object, you actually get essentially a description, a full one sentence description of the selected object. The difference here is that instead we have a dialogue. So, uh, and uh, you might see a bit more variety in the sense that for um, there might be multiple dialogues that would lead equally to uh, one description of one object in an image. Um, any questions about the game so far? Yes, no? All right. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so, so in this case, we get... Um, we do get this, this sort of, you know, buying research type of strategy that must emerge. That's totally true, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? All right. So yeah, so I'm gonna start showing some statistics from the data that was collected to give you some insight as to how people play this game and what kind of data is in there. Uh, so you might wanna consider it. Um, so as I said, you were taking images from MS Coco. Uh, the objects that are um, too small, we just don't include as potential uh, objects uh, to be selected. And we keep only images between three and 20 objects. Um, so in terms of the answers, what's kind of interesting is that when you look at the Oracle answers, the actual people playing the game, uh, about half of the time the answer is yes, half of the time it's no. So it's actually fairly biased, uh, sorry, balanced, not biased. Um, and there's about five questions on average per dialogue. We get about a bit more than two dialogues on average for each image. Most, the vast majority of dialogues of, of games were successful uh, when collecting data. There were a few that were unsuccessful and some non-completed for uh, I think people getting disconnected or, or determining, I guess, that they want to play anymore. Um, and you have the numbers here. That's why we have three different categories. There's the full data set of all games, uh, only those that were finished, and those that were uh, um, uh, finished and, and successful. So if you just consider those, say, uh, we get a sizable you know, uh, 131,000 dialogues, a lot of questions, so those are the so listing out all the questions from all the dialogues. Uh, the total number of words is about three million and the number of distinct words is on the order of 10,000. Um, so if you just filter out uh, words that have a frequency of three uh, or more, you get about 5,000 words. Total that's uh, 62,000 different images and the number of objects that might be involved in a game is uh, over 100,000. All right, so let's just look at how people have been playing it. Uh, that's the distribution of the dialogue, but you see there's a fairly you know, fat tail here. We can go from 10 to 15. There's a substantial number of those dialogues that are actually pretty long, but otherwise on average it's sort of here at five. There's also a lot of those that are fairly short. I think one interesting uh, property of this is that there might be an implicit kind of curriculum learning going on if you train on this. That is, there are a lot of easy cases and short games that you might be able to play first, and that might lead you to eventually be better on the longer ones. So I think that's kind of an interesting dis and yeah, cool distribution to have. If you look at um, the length of the dialogues as, the, as a function of the number of potential objects in the images, um, you do see this more logarithmic increase, 
which does suggest that users are, are uh, the questioners when they're playing the questioners. They're using a strategy that's close to a binary search, closer than uh, if you just try to ask a question that's very specific to each individual object in a linear way, where you instead get a linear increase. Uh, so it does, the data does have something that's like a rational, you know, smart way of, of playing this game. Um, you can look at uh, what's the ratios of answers that are yes of the questions as the dialogue moves forward for different dialogue lengths. So each of these lines is a different dialogue. This di those would be all the dialogues of length two, so two questions. This one of length three, four, and so on. Uh, so this one is nine. What is kind of interesting is that you see that for the harder ones, you tend to get much more no's than the, uh, sorry, the longer ones, you get much more no's early on than you get uh, yeses. And usually towards the end of the dialogue, um, it looks like the people are trying to get a few yeses. They're asking questions like, at this point, my interpretation as to why the ratio of yeses increases pretty rapidly is that they've already sort of figured out what it is, but they're looking for maybe some form of confirmation. Uh, but in any case, that's kind of an interesting behavior. In terms of what types of words people are using, um, so we can look at what's the distribution of the words used in the first question, second question, third question, and so on. Uh, one that's very, very common is whether it's a person or not, because persons are, you know, uh, over all the, uh, more or less all the images in MS Coco. Um, so you get more questions about what type of object it is. Then you already start moving to a position. So our objects, you know, to the left, to the top, to the right. And then eventually you start getting more questions about properties of these objects that aren't uh, locations. Like, uh, is it white? Is it wearing something, I guess? Black, red, uh, and so on. So other kind of statistics that might be of interest here. Um, the success rate as a function of the number of potential objects decreases, um, so that's not too surprising. If there are more confounding objects, the dialogue is harder, the game is harder. So you, in this case, just pay attention to the dotted line here. Uh, we can look at the success rate as a function of the size of the object, spatially in the image, and the bigger the object, the easier it is usually to identify. Not too surprising either. All right, that sort of covers the statistics about the game. And, Having collected all of this data, then we set out to try to see how hard are the uh, tasks of the oracle as well as the task of the questioner. Uh, so the first task uh, for the oracle is essentially a yes, no, non-applicable classification problem where um, the relevant information that you'd want as input is what we call the context, which is the full image. Um, the crop of the selected object so we can extract this crop based on a segmentation mask. We also consider adding explicit spatial information ab uh, about the selected object. So remember, this is the oracle, so the oracle has access to what object is selected. So in this case, we represent that as an eight-dimensional vector where we put what is the minimum value uh, and the maximum value of the x and y axis, what's the center x, y, and what's the width and height of the box. This is over parameterized for the spatial information, uh, but you know, the higher dimensional vector shouldn't hurt here. Um, we also input the object category, which is very specific to uh, Microsoft Coco. The fact that these objects are labeled and the information is there. Uh, I think ideally, eventually, we wouldn't want to rely on this, uh, but that makes the task potentially easier, so, uh, so why not to start? And we also want to put as input a representation of uh, the question that is being asked. And so in this case, we use an LSTM that goes from left to right, and then we take the last state, and that becomes the, uh, or hidden state, and that becomes the representation here. And so we concatenate the vector representations of all these informations, and we feed that to a feed forward neural network, fully connected, and with a three-way uh, softmax at the output. Okay? So that's a very, very simple model. If you had to come up with you know, the simplest baseline for tackling this task, like essentially, there's not much research to be done if this works really well. So let's see. Um, so we did a pretty extensive ablation study here. Uh, if we start at the very top here, those are essentially kind of measuring are there any sort of 
non-interesting biases in uh, the yes and no's or the, the answers uh, to the questions. Uh, so if we just answer no all the time, because that's the dominant uh, um, uh, category, uh, we're at about 50%. Um, so because essentially yeses and no's are balanced. If we just feed in the question, we're still pretty close to 50. Same thing with the image or the crop. Image is the, what I also call the context. Now, if we start actually uh, at least conditioning on the question, but then feeding in just one additional information, we start getting uh, lower error rates here. Um, the one that seems to work best is just the category. It is a pretty high level and potentially, you know, a pretty rich information really about, uh, and salient information about the uh, object. It is kind of surprising just from the question and category, it, it lowers all that much. But if we then add spatial information, uh, we do get a bit of uh, a win here with 4% decrease. Uh, and that makes sense. Some of the questions are focusing explicitly on not properties of objects, but location. And what is kind of disappointing, at least in this work, is that if we go further and add to the uh, category in the spatial information, the crop itself, which has much more information about what object is uh, selected, uh, we don't even see a gain here. So at least for this very simple baseline, uh, we're not getting, uh, uh, you know, we don't seem to be extracting in the right way the information that's in this contextual information for the yes, no answering uh, task. Uh, the task too, so the questioner actually has to do two things, asking questions and actually eventually guessing what the uh, selected object is. And so we separate that into two tasks. Um, so the questioner guessing task, uh, in this case, you have a history in the dialogue, uh, which we encode using either an LSTM or um, HRED model, which is a sort of more sophisticated hierarchical model for, for dialogues. We have levels that run just within each um, uh, question, and then we have another level that uh, skips at every question. Um, and in this situation, the, uh, and then we have the context, which is the full image. So we take that as a vector, and then we compare it with um, just the spatial information and the category of each potential object in the game that can be selected. Uh, we just use these two information because they work best in the Oracle task in terms of features. And so we have an MLP that takes that information and outputs an embedding of the object. And then we compare the embedding based on the history of questions and answers and the context with the embedding obtained by this uh, thing here, which just takes the object representation and outputs an embedding. And we take the dot product and feed that to a softmax, so that gives us a softmax over all potential object categories. So if we do this, um, the performance isn't great. So the test error, if as a human, would be like below 10%. But uh, the best thing that we could do is just use an SDM only over the dialogue, not even looking at the uh, context, the full image. And in this case, we get something more like 38.7% error, which is pretty high. So there's a lot of improvement to be done here uh, beyond this you know, fairly simple model. And finally, we can look at the question generator. Um, so in this case, the model that we consider is some form of hierarchical RNN that uh, given the previous questions as well as their answers would then uh, generate a full sentence uh, that would correspond to the next question being asked. Um, so that's, you know, kind of seek to seek like, you know, very standard thing to do. Um, and now we can't really, so the way to evaluate this, we could, you know, look at log probs of the actual questions being asked. But really, there is one goal, which is to be successful at the game. So what we can do is just fix the oracle that we've trained with the data, and uh, fix the guesser as well, and just use the question generator to generate questions in the game. We fix it to always generate five questions, no more, no less. Uh, of course, something more clever that would learn when to stop asking questions would be better, but that's the first thing to start. And then we feed the questions to uh, both the oracle to get the yes, no answers, and to the guesser that's pre-trained to guess the object and see how successful we are at the game. And the answer is not super successful. 
Um, so this is the best we could do with human-generated dialogues. This is essentially the error of the oracle. Now, if we use the generator uh, that's either trained on the ground truth or trained on the actual output of the oracle, uh, we're at like 50%, 60%, so not super great. 50% is, is not chance because there are multiple objects, so that's not entirely bad. So it suggests that the task is solvable, but it's definitely not trivial. So you see that random would have been like 82%. So we're better than random with the simple baseline, but there's still some room to go. All right, so I'll just end by mentioning some future directions. So I just suggested um, you might want to do RL here because we have a reward signal, which is success of the game. And we could do this to just train everything together. Uh, here in this paper that was presented at this workshop and that's accepted at uh, Ichkai, uh, uh, with, uh, again, Florian and Harm. Uh, so they've looked at just training with re reinforce the questioner, keeping the other components fixed. And they do get an improvement in, in I think here this isn't uh, errors, this is now success rate. Uh, so uh, more like a 60% success rate, which humans would be at like 90. Um, so some improvement, still some room to go, but that's definitely a really interesting, I think, direction to consider. What would be interesting is training everything with RL, so the oracle adapting to the questioner and vice versa. That's something that hasn't been done yet. We can try to improve the oracle, which is decent, but as I've mentioned, using information, more you know, richer information about the crop doesn't seem to work all that well or be helpful. Um, now we have a submission at NIPS where we have a different, more sophisticated architecture which you, where we use something known as a conditional batch norm where in the extraction of the image features, we actually use the question to essentially gate the various feature maps at uh, various locations. So essentially changing how at all layers of a, a ResNet we process the visual information to get a feature representation. And that allowed us to uh, now be able to exploit successfully the crop and get a little bit of a win uh, with 19.52% uh, error as opposed to the 21.5 which we got before with the, with the baseline. But I think, again, there's much more room to go. This isn't even considering the context. It's just looking at the crop, the spatial uh, information in the category. So I think still some, some, some room to left to, to innovate. And so other opportunities, I think it's a nice benchmark for working on better dialogue models as opposed to a fairly simple LSTM uh, model for the questioner. Um, there's also, as I said, training all uh, components with RL simultaneously, I think, would be very interesting. Uh, and even seeing from scratch what kind of language it discovers would be interesting. Um, one thing that I would really like to push this research uh, towards is actually can we use this game as a form of um, unsupervised learning that we can run on any image and see does it learn better features of, of images this way? Because the game in itself isn't entirely useful, I think. But I think the potential there is that through this game, we can have models that better understand images. And I think uh, this is you know, further down the line, but a very interesting direction to take this research towards. And actually using other forms of guess what game. So a guess what game is essentially a game where there are two players and one player has you know, partial information about a context. Uh, there might be other situations where we can collect interesting data in this way, where we can collect you know, data about people communicating to sort of recover missing information. Maybe there are you know, conversational recommender systems that we come, uh, come up with where there's actually you know, an exchange in natural language about uh, preferences of people in a similar setup, or other situations where we might collect interesting data like that. Um, so there's a website where you can play the game, you can download the code, both for the simulator. I realize this pales in comparison with Parlay because that's one website for one data set as opposed to like 50 something, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I don't know, hopefully maybe guess what will be on Parlay at some point. In any case, you can go there, you can even play against the AI, which is kind of fun. And uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you. Questions? Um, okay, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Sure. And uh, my question is, what do you think the community should focus on this data set? Should we 
try to solve one task at a time so to bring it, because this looks like a really complicated uh, method a lot altogether. of components yeah should we focus one at a time like one paper like focus on task or every time try to solve everything at once I, I get you. a sense that we haven't, that's a great question. So I, I get a sense that for each task, there's still a fair amount of improvement that needs to be made. I think the first one that's easiest to look at is the Oracle. Uh, the questioner really to improve it, I feel you, it will be very helpful to have a good Oracle. Um, and uh, presumably the guesser part, so guessing the object is maybe a bit more approachable. Uh, I think it makes sense to f um, sort of potentially just focus, especially if you're not very familiar with RL, to just focus on the purely labeled tasks. But it kind of depends also on your interest. Like if you're really into reinforcement learning, I think you will still learn something out of taking fairly simple whatever is the current best performing methods for each of these parts of the, of the system and just do better RL. Like I suspect that any better RL would help more or less no matter what these components are. Um, but the easiest are definitely the Oracle task, and probably the guesser task is, is still, you know, there's a fair amount of improvements to be made there. Yeah, I have two quick questions. But first, I, I probably missed something or misunderstood. Like, how is the end of dialogue defined? Like, how do you know that he found the correct object, the person asking the questions? Right, so the simulator can compare the answer with their ground truth. So the questioner will be informed. So of course the questioner cannot, uh, it can only guess until it gets the answer. But essentially, you know, this is all running in one system. So the system, the website knows what object was actually selected for the oracle, uh, and then can just compare that with the guess from the questioner. No, no I, I guess I'm seeing understanding. Like you're supposed to ask yes, uh, yes questions, and then you get an answer yes, no, until you understood where the object, what the object's being That's taken. That's right. But then so how, how do you say I, I think is this object in an unambiguous way? So the. Sorry. Yeah, so, so you click in the interface. You would see all the objects, and so you click on the right one. So then when you drag around your mouse, you see like a segment. Presentation is only shown when the questioner says, I'm ready to guess. Then all the potential objects are revealed to the questioner, okay. and then uh, he or she clicks on the one. It, and at that point, if the they right get one. it wrong, then that would be the failure cases, the 7% yes, failures. that's right. And you can't recover from this. Like then the game is done. Okay. Then my follow-up question so regarding the question about the in the first version of this trying to solve this task, the image seems not to help the crop. Oh, then you could run in, if this is how you confirm, you could run a baseline where you actually only show a black image with boxes, so you don't have shape information, and you just say these are the categories that each one of these boxes represents, mm -hmm. and then ask a human try to solve the task. Will be trying to do the same. You will have a human baseline for what if you don't have the crop. Right, right. I, I, I guess we could do that. The fact is that I am much more led to believe that the models are just not exploiting that information as much as they should. Uh, so, um, but uh, yes, you're right. They would evaluate that. It, it also allow you to get a hint of how much biases there is on just the special location and the, the categories independent of the appearance, right? Since most of the first questions are about what is it and where is it, mm -hmm. then you get a feel of how much of the oh, problem I see what is solvable saying. with just yeah. that. Okay, that's, that's not a bad suggestion. Yeah, I see. Hey, um, so I, I'm really interested in the last point about unsupervised learning of visual representations from these reference games uh, where, through uh, agents that communicate. And I've thought about that a, a little bit. One problem that you run into is almost feels like it's a chicken and egg problem because in order to set up the game, you need some supervision of these segmentation masks. And so it's not at that point unsupervised anymore. Yeah. And I've It will have some sort of prior about how we know objects are segmented out of images, for instance. So you right. need, yeah. So then it, it almost feels like we're solving a harder problem because we have to understand, we have to have representations of language, we have to learn the CNN parameters through clustering of these patches mm -hmm. into what may look like objects. And so is there enough there to get off the ground? Or so, can we just do? I mean, you know, GANs, they have the same chicken and egg problem to some extent, right? And yet, I mean, we have some progress in terms of doing semi-supervised learning. Um, we're not at the point where we just run GANs on the whole web and we get super awesome object recognition and all 
cases, but um, I don't know that, I mean, it's possible that here we're starting from much less. Part of that is alleviated by the fact that we did collect some data. Um, so I, th I agree it's a risk, but I think that short of actually doing all the research that's been done in GANs, someone could have you know, highlighted that potential difficulty and it turns out it was okay. So, um, so I th that's why I'm part it's partly why I'm hopeful. Okay, thanks. Are there any more questions for Hugo? Okay, let's thank Hugo. Thank you. And now we are going to transition to the panel. So can I request all the panel members to come up and take their seats? Hello, uh, I would like to ask you about if you see any practical applications for companies, how company would use such technology of visual question answering? That's for you, James. <laughs> 